Hey everyone. Um, sorry for the long lapse in um, being here. It's been a crazy week. Um, a lovely weekend, but also full of work. I have been on, I swear to the gods, nonstop Zoom calls and classes for the last six days. I'm sick of my own voice. Um, all I do is talk. Talk, 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 talk. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that I'm alone in the room. I'm here alone in my office, and all I do is talk, 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 talk. So um, it's insanity. Um, sometimes I talk to no one when I'm teaching my class. I don't get to see my students. I'm talking to no one. Sometimes I'm talking to staff. Sometimes I'm talking to um, grad students. Um, but mostly it's um, nonstop talking. And then I look at my emails and they're like, right now I just look, they're at 145. Let's see what they are after this um, Facebook Live, what my, what my um, emails are. And it's just been crazy. And the reason it's been so crazy is some of you may not know this because, you know, I play an Egyptologist on TV. <laughs> but um, because, you know, you see me in this venue and one of my undergrads was like, oh, I just saw you on TV. I'm like, oh, no, which one? And, you know, I do play an Egyptologist on TV. But you may not know that I am also chair of my department at UCLA which means that I deal with the staff for figuring out all of this pandemic crisis budgeting. And we have to figure out, you know, who's teaching what, which lectures are doing what, which grad students are doing what. And that in a normal year is enough. But during pandemic year, everybody who was going to, in my, the department I'm chair of is the Middle Eastern Studies Department at UCLA, but it uses an old fashioned term. We're called the Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department which is an old fashioned way of saying the Middle Eastern Studies Department. Um, we mainly do history and archeology, span but we also teach the Persian, the Armenian, the Hebrew and the Arabic. Um, so I have to make sure all those are taken care of. And all of the, the grad students, and we have about 60 graduate students in my department to take care of, they all had summer plans. They had awesome summer plans. Some were going to North Africa, some were going to the Levant, some were going to Turkey, some were gonna to go to language intensive schools and you know learn this or that, teach this or that. And, um, and most things have been canceled, right? So if you're an archeologist and you were gonna go and work um, someplace in North Africa or in Egypt or Ethiopia or Sudan, mish mumkin, as they say in Egyptian Arabic, mish mumkin, not possible. And so with all of these things being canceled, everyone needs a job. <laughs> everyone needs summer funding. People are not subletting their Los Angeles places and finding, um, you know, subletting and then going off, finding some cheap place to live in Morocco and learning Arabic for the summer. This is now not possible. And so now everyone needs some sort of employment. And every day is another set of emails saying, can I teach this class? What about that class? And, and we're just scrambling, trying to fall over ourselves, trying to find opportunities where they are for everyone who needs an opportunity. And it's, um, it's been a lot, a lot. That's my absence. Um, and so, but, but I'm here now. So, um, so lots of, lots of stuff, um, in my life, but I feel, um, I feel like I'm doing okay. I feel like I'm able to take care of those grad students and that we're able to find opportunities and we're well connected and people are going to be okay. And I think um, the hard work has had, has had a payoff. So it's, um, it's great. It's really good. And it's amazing to see all of the professors in my department, all of the lecturers in my department, and all of the grad students in my department turn towards the, the Zoom remote teaching with such passion and ability and, and really make that pivot and enable us to teach just as many, if not more classes this summer as we had last summer. And to see that is so very exciting and to see it done so professionally and so well is quite gratifying. So I am, I am very, very happy. Um, so let's have a sip of coffee. Um, if anyone knows how to, I, I used to be able to know, know how to do my Facebook live so I could turn it so it's not mirrored. But when I do that now, the screen either squishes my face or turns me green. So you have to look at everything backwards and I won't show any books, so it doesn't matter. Um, 
someone says you're managing so much and so well. Well, the other reason that I'm managing so much and so well is that my ex-husband is doing all of the homeschooling of my 10 year old. So, <laughs> thank you. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, because if I had to do the homeschooling of my 10 year old plus take care of the department during a pandemic with a global um, budget crunch for all of higher ed, and teach a new class for, of Egyptian religion for 200 students and work on all of my other projects, then it would be, it'd be pretty tough. Um, I have some good news um, in this pandemic. Uh, I just received funding with two co-PIs, two co-principal investigators about um, excavation work. Oh, I just broke a pen. About, <laughs> about excavation work um, just outside of the Karnak uh, walls. So I may find myself in Luxor more often than not in the near future. So that's not near future, as soon as we can travel again, right? As soon as it's safe. Um, but I, have do, I do have funding to do that work, which is great. And I would like to thank my, my um, co-PIs or the PI Assam and my co-PI Danny for getting that together. It's really, really awesome. So, um, so that's a big deal. And uh, now, now we're going to look at what we can do with the 25th Dynasty, Kings of Kush, um, and, um, and how we'll, we'll be able to study Egypt under the thumb of empire, uh, what it's like for Egypt when the Assyrians invade, the Neo-Babylonians invade, the Kushites invade, and then, um, and then of course, we have uh, the Persians, and then Alexander the Great, and on and on, um, to the British, and... Now what, American, Saudi, Emirati hegemony? Don't know, but one could argue that Egypt is still under a sort of imperial <laughs> control, if only through money. Um, that's probably the most controversial I've said thing I've said on here in a long time. Um, so one super shout out um, that's really important is that next week on Wednesday the 13th, at 10 a.m. Pacific, that's 1 p.m., right? 1 p.m. Eastern Time, I am going to be doing the Facebook Live feed for National Geographic. And it's going to be an hour-long presentation, about 30 minutes of stories and me reading your comments, and then about 30 minutes of, of Q&A of you guys asking me whatever it is you want to ask. And um, I'll talk about... This thing that I just did with National Geographic that you can apparently still get in pandemic grocery stores across the country. Um, and I'll be talking about other things. So you can tune in then. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, different from, well, it'll probably be just like this, but with more people. <laughs> and apparently, because it's National Geographic and they have so many followers, they'll be they, they said oh each one gets like 1500 to 2000 comments so i don't know how i'm going to be able to to keep up with that so if i ask if i answer your question you'll have won the national geographic facebook live lottery which is kind of cool um let's see 3 a.m australian time why are you awake oh during the facebook live i thought you meant now <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, but, but you'll be able to find it on their page. So just go, when you wake up, go to the National Geographic United States page and, and I'll be there. And, um, let's see if, if there's any other ways. I'm, I'm sure I'll be able to post it onto my page after the fact as well. So I'll make sure it's, it's up there and we'll do some cross promotion. Um, so, oh, hey, Danny, look at you. Yay. So exciting, right? That's so great. Um, when women rule the world just arrived at my house. Oh my God, that's crazy. All those powerful women are invading your home now. Um, let's see how that goes. Yeah, I, for the National Geographic thing, I'm going to talk about stereotypes of the female, um, why we're so afraid of the hormonal female. That should be fun. Um, through, through a few different stories. And I have some props. I don't normally use props. I just have coffee, right? But for the Nat Geo thing, I'm going to have actual props. Will be fun. I need a statue of Sakmet, and I have all kinds of crazy things that have been gifted to me over the years. But I don't have a statue of Sakmet. Um, this is a lack in my life. I have hippos. I have I have all kinds of stuff, but no Sakmet. 
So if anyone is in Los Angeles and knows where I live, I'm not giving out my address, then you can drop off a Sockmet statue at my front door. Um, so, um, okay, so I don't have anything planned for today. So just um, ask away. What have we got? Let's see. Uh, ba -bum. Women ruling the world. Karnak. Oh, Karnak. Um, should we talk about Karnak? Let's talk about Karnak. Um, my exam for uh, my PhD back in 1997, oh, I have just dated myself, um, was tell me about the building program of Thebes East and West Bank, including all, the temple building program of East and West Bank Thebes. And it took me, I think, five hours of writing with a pen um, and I think like four blue books because, you know, we didn't have, everyone didn't have a computer and we didn't type out exams. We still did things longhand. Um, that was a pretty intense essay exam. And the biggest part of it was of course Karnak Temple because I went through Karnak in my mind and drew plans how Karnak works and um, who built what and where starting from the heart of Karnak and then extending out into the outer perimeters. And Temple spaces, I love walking through Egyptian temple spaces. And Karnak Temple is one of my favorite uh, temple spaces. I mean, how could it not be? The hypostyle hall is there. Um, the inner courtyard areas or the, the inner um, uh, sanctuary areas have all of these things dedicated by Hatshepsut and then erased afterwards. Um, there's Middle Kingdom activity going on at Karnak. There's all kinds of old structures that were found in blocks dismantled inside of pylons underneath foundations that you can then, that archaeologists can then take out and reconstruct. And one of the best parts of Karnak Temple today is to go to the Open Air Museum and see all of these structures that have been set up again um, as best as, as we know how. I mean, if you just have blocks, you have to figure out what the actual temple structure was, how big it was, what's on the inside of the block, what's on the outside, if it's decorated on two sides. Um, and, and there's wonderful things there. And the last time I was at Karnak, I was spending so much time going through this, that's two times actually, so much time going through the actual temple environs themselves that I didn't get to the open air museum. And um, two times in a row until nightfall, and then it's too dark to see anything and you're super frustrated and annoyed. And I never have enough time in that open air museum. So the next time I get to Luxor, my, my key um, agenda item will be to spend a, a good deal of time at the open air museum and, um, and see what, what I can see. Because the French mission that works at Karnak and that has the concession, I'll explain that in a bit, um, they have been pulling out so many of these blocks that the Egyptians have, have used as fill for other structures. And in the past uh, two decades have done a really good job reconstructing the buildings in this open air museum. So there is a lot to see that I haven't consumed yet um, with my eyes. And so that will, be, that will be really fun. Now, I mentioned the word concession, which is pretty interesting. Egyptian sites have been separated up into different concessions, and this was done according to rules developed by colonialist powers back in the day. Um, the British had colonial control over Egypt until 1950, and yet the antiquities organization seemed to be in the hands of the French, um, even up until 1950, despite the British colonial control. And that colonialism has continued within the realm of Egyptology and still is very strong up to this day. And um, it's incredibly frustrating for Egyptians that the PhDs that are going to get them advanced in their career the most come from outside of Egypt, not inside of Egypt, um, from places in the United States or Britain or Australia to some extent or France or Germany. And that when you get a PhD in one of those European places, then you can come back to Egypt as a conquering hero and um, do really well in your Egyptological career. It's ridiculously unfair that colonialism has done this to Egyptology within Egypt, 
but it also has to do with Egypt turning Arab and Egypt turning Muslim and disconnecting from the Egyptian antiquities and culture that was there before, such that a Muslim Arab, somebody who says, I'm an Egyptian Muslim Arab, will not find a cultural connection with pharaonic antiquities, like Karnak Temple itself, or a statue of Sakhmet or something. And so because of this cultural disconnect, colonialism is alive and well within Egyptology, and Karnak is still to this day a French concession. But Egyptian nationalism and nationalistic forces are slowly clawing this back. And it seems that Karnak is much less of a French concession than it has been uh, for the past hundred years. The Egyptians are now are, are taking power back over their monuments and their own sites and running them themselves. And things can get pretty scrappy and pretty difficult. Um, also remember that so much of the money used to um, pave the way for tourists to walk in a temple um, or to, to create a, a museum space or to build a new structure for antiquities, so much of that money comes from abroad and not from internally within Egypt, but you get grant money from USAID or grant money from the French Institute or grant money from, um, from other entity, Germans, um, Japanese as well. Um, when that money comes from the outside, so there too goes the power. And so that's also put the Egyptians on the back foot when they're dealing with their own antiquities in their own country. Um, a lot of this is changing, and I, I would like to say that most Egyptologists who are working in Egypt today know that every project they do needs to have an Egyptian partner, that we can't just go in and say, okay, I'm gonna look at this site or that site and not bring an Egyptian partner um, on a peer-peer level along with you uh, for the research. Um, this research that I'll be doing at, um, at Karnak Temple or just outside the walls of Karnak Temple has an Egyptian partner involved. Um, in fact, he is the PI, he's the principal investigator. I'm just a co-PI, I'm just a, a little thing. Um, but Karnak being a French concession, it means you have to go to the Egyptians and to the French <laughs> to work in this place. Um, and the, the money that's gone into reconstructing places like the Hypostyle Hall or reconstructing structures in the open air museum or putting paving stones down so that people don't walk on the original paving stones and destroy them because bus after bus of tourists when there's not a pandemic goes through this site. Um, so much of that money does come from foreign entities and those things need to be uh, organized and um, respectfully and properly brought into Egypt as well. Um, my favorite part of Karnak Temple is probably on the northern side, out in the middle of a whole bunch of scrub brush in the area of the Osirian chapels. That is the northern side, isn't it? I think, or no, is that, is it the northern or southern side? What's the eastern? Oh my God, look at my lack of orientation. When you go into the left, um, there's all of these Osiris chapels that nobody pays attention to, that look kind of like ass, because they're not that well carved, most of them, certainly compared to what Amenhotep III could do or Tutmos III, um, the carving is not that great. But they're out there away from all of the tourists. You don't have to deal with all the buses. You can walk around Karnak and not see people, um, but you can still go around and see these, these little chapel structures. And you can see how Karnak, a temple dedicated to the god Amun-Re, his consort Mut, and his son Kansu, ended up um, in the late period becoming a space dedicated to Osiris as much as to Amun-Re, which is really, it's kind of bizarre. You know, you have an Amun-Re temple and then all of a sudden you start to get all of these Osirian things brought in and how does that work and why? And I have some basic theories that I haven't um, really put to the test or worked on in any sort of... Um, rigorous fashion, but it has to do with the Bronze Age collapse in my work on coffins, that as you are more defensive with your burial and you're worried about tomb robbery and the necropolis are unsafe, you bury your dead family members in secret, unmarked, 
in places that, that are high in a cliffside or someplace far away where people can't find them. This means that you can't go to a tomb chapel and stand in front of a stela and connect with your dead relative above the space where you know their body is buried. It means that you can't have a funeral with all of the rituals that are involved in that funeral at the tomb space where you know your dead family member is buried. And so, you, because you have to keep that tomb safe, but you still want to connect with the dead. Everyone wants to connect with our ancestors, with our mothers and fathers, grandparents, all of those ancestors that, that help us to feel connected to our world, our culture, our language, make us feel safe in a very dangerous world of epidemics and sicknesses and, and um, economic scarcity and other problems. So how did the Egyptians deal with burying their dead in an unmarked, hidden, secret space and still connect with their dead? Well, it seems that starting with dynasties 20 and 21, they actually started to do funerary rituals within temple spaces, which makes a whole lot of sense, right? So what was like a state temple or a temple space for Montu or Sakhmet or whatever divinity is worshipped in that space now is for that god or goddess as well as for the dead. So you have an insertion of all of this funerary rituality and funerary imagery pushed into these temple spaces that didn't have it before. And it happens at a time period when people are, are much more defensive about their burials. So all of this Osirian um, temple activity, all of these chapels are put up by kings pretty quickly um, they're not super gorgeous spaces. They're kind of off the beaten track of the main temple itself, but it probably gave people who couldn't have access to their tombs and their ancestors a means of connecting with the dead in a place in community with other people. It's like um, if you want to pray to or talk to uh, a deceased parent and you go to a church and you talk to your mother and father in your mind in that church space and somehow I think many of us feel more connected in that sacred space mosque temple church whatever it is you go there to connect with that ancestor if you don't have a grave to visit if um, if they've been cremated and those ashes have been scattered you'll still go to a, a holy place what you consider holy to connect with that ancestor so the um, part of Karnak that I'll be investigating with my my um, uh, team will be one of these Osiris chapels and that's that's pretty cool and it'll be a late period one as well when Egypt is um, brought into this maelstrom of, of being imperialized by a number of different forces and um, it's going to move my work beyond the new kingdom and beyond the third intermediate period in the Bronze Age collapse and into much later data sets so it actually works perfectly to um, to, to move some of my work on kingship forward. And I think now I may actually add a chapter to the book that I'm writing now on um, the, and add a 25th dynasty Kushite chapter. Um, we'll see. Because uh, I was gonna end it with Ramses II, but maybe we should have a late period guy in there as well. So um, let, let's see what I end up doing. So I've, I've spoken for 20 minutes. Um, yeah, concessions, Colossi of Memnon, Valley of the Kings and Queens. I'm not, you know, I worked in tombs. I, I think I'm really excited to get into a temple space. Enough coffins and death, right? Here's it here. Enough. <laughs> let's let's get to some um, ritual spaces maybe and and um, and do something a little bit a little bit different. Um, why do some of the, okay, this will be my last thing. Why do, this is from Walter Williams. Why do some of the pylons at Karnak flagpole niches look like they have been scooped out with a giant scooper or chisel? Excellent question, Walter Williams. And I really like it. And I think what you're thinking about are the flagstaff um, areas in front of the second pylon. So every pylon is meant to have these big flagpoles with the streamers, the banners of the temple um, streaming atop, attached to those flagpoles. Each of those flagpoles is made of a giant trunk of cedar imported from the Lebanon. It's like screaming, look at my money, look at my wealth, look at what I can do. To put four to six of those in front of your temple 
big giant cedar tree trunks is to really advertise your wealth as a, as a temple builder, as a king. And the ones that you're thinking of in front of the second pylon at Karnak, they do look scooped out and they do have kind of a curved structure around them. And the reason they do is because they were burned when the Assyrians came into Egypt and sacked Memphis and then sacked Thebes. And I think the date is 663 BCE. And I think that the king is Ashurbanipal. You guys can fact check me on that. But I think when Thebes was sacked by the Assyrians, those cedar flagpoles burned. They were emblazoned with electrum and gold and all of it got so hot, all of that wood and all of that metal, that it melted the sandstone around it. So it's actually got this smooth carved out surface um, all up and down that second pylon um, where those flagpoles used to be. So there's a lot of even trauma um, trials and tribulations visible in the stone in, as wounds in Karnak Temple. Um, and there's more of the, there's so much more about Karnak Temple that one can talk about. So I'll end it here. Um, apologies for taking such a long break. I'll try to do better. But just know that um, I'm hustling, hustling for my people, trying to keep everybody as safe as they can be. And um, so everyone go out and, and do that for your people. <laughs> and then if everyone does that for their people, um, then maybe the world will be a better place. So thank you and till next time.